Hey y'all, it's Edward from WBC, the World Board Game Championships, uh, here in Seven Springs Mountain Resort in, I guess, South Mid-Central Pennsylvania. Go with it, sure. Happy to be joined by the designer of the acclaimed Seki Gohara and as well as Tim Goose. So Matt, thanks for taking the time today. Hi Edward, it's fantastic to be uh, speaking with you. Thank you for the opportunity. We are actually at the Seki Gohara tournament here on, on Monday at the WBC. Yep. And it's been going all day. Uh, we I, started with the demo at nine o'clock. We had round <laughs> one at 10. We are on round four at this point. And we got 11 games still going still on. Still going. Us. That's and, right. And by 11 games, four. we mean 11 games of Seki Gohara specifically. That's right. This is amazing. So we're filling up the foggy goggle. The yeah, foggy right. goggle is the uh, the, the ski uh, the, the ski ski, go, ski bar. It's a ski, ski bar, something. right? Yeah, yeah, so okay. we're looking out at the uh, the slopes, and we've got mountain decor, and we have Sekigahara as far as the eye can see. This is this this got to feel pretty. This is amazing, a vacation, right? right? This is this is how it's done. That's wonderful, actually. And I, I just played a terrific game and. You know, people are people are really enjoying it. Uh, this is the best thing about designing games is that uh, you know, seeing that people enjoy it. Oh, I, I imagine that's got to just, it never gets old. That feeling of, that's wow, wonderful. they're playing my game and having yeah. a great time doing it, right? That's right. That's I mean, very I, cool. A game is, is, is art, in my opinion, but it's, it's, it's only meaningful if people appreciate it. That's a fair point, totally. So let's, okay, since we're surrounded by Seki Gohara, let's yeah. start there. So how did Seki Gohara come to be? Well, I studied Japanese history when I was in college. I took just one class in it, but I loved it, and I was fascinated by Japan. I've always been interested, and I traveled there twice, and I wanted to bring that alive. When I write a new game, I've published three so far, but I got a lot of the designs. I, I start with a concept that's interesting to me, something I want to research. So I'll begin with the history of Japan, or an interesting conflict in the history, or my latest game is about building an airline in the 30s. I'll take a topic that I'm interested in, and then the game is like an excuse to research it deeply. <laughs> so I, I, then I get the books, and then I go there, right? One of the main roads here in Sekigahara, and you'll know it if you played the game, is the Nakasendo. I hiked the Nakasendo as I was researching this game. I went to Japan and I saw how big that road is. And if you know you know this game, yes. it's really important how many people you can march down that road. Well, I can tell you, I measured it, right? Seriously. I know how far across that road is. And there's a reason why the road restrictions are such a big deal in this game. That's fascinating. So it's all theme first and, and then everything else comes with it. So how did you come up with, how did you decide, you know what, a block war game right. would really fit this. Yeah, well, I like block war games. I like them because uncertainty is a fundamental part of the game. I, th I take issue, actually, with a lot of war games giving you too much information. I think the typical war game gives you an ahistorical perspective, a god's eye view, that you shouldn't have had and that isn't similar to how the protagonists really felt. Especially in the period, they didn't have radios back then, right? Oh, yeah, they certainly didn't. In fact, even the Sekigahara board gives you more information than you should have, <laughs> even if all the opponent's blocks are turned against you. Sure, it's sure. still too much information. But there's a substantial fog of war in Sekigahara, and that's where the uncertainty comes from. There are no dice. I love that there don't have to be dice because there's just uncertainty. What cards does my opponent have? What blocks does my opponent have? That's enough uncertainty to keep the game lively and to keep their risk and bluff and, and dare in the game without adding randomization. So I love that element of block games and it escapes from the, uh, the, the over-informedness that you see in typical war games where every chit is at your disposal and you not only know where every unit is, but how well they're going to fight. That strikes me as very unrealistic. So even though you get all the data right, that's not how it felt to be a commander in that moment. And I'm trying to give you the feeling. Okay. Um, so how did the cards come into play? How, okay, so how did you, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how did you decide to pair the blocks with the cards? Yeah, this is an unusual game and you don't have the same hand size throughout the, the game. You, as you know, if you've played it, you begin with only five cards and toward the mid game, you've built up to 10 or more and you spend the cards. You don't just play them, you actually spend hand size in order to do certain things like do an all out movement or, or force march or, or something like that. So you're actually using up your cards. The hand size equals legitimacy. Yeah, I needed something. When I designed this game, I realized that one of the critical issues that this conflict was about, and the hinge on which it turned, was legitimacy. Who had the most? In the end, Tokugawa had more than Ishida, and I needed to reflect that in something really fundamental in the game, which is where cards came in, and the, and the, the hand size 
you got more cards to at your disposal. You can do more. You can motivate more troops. You can move more troops. You can muster more. You, it's it's an it's a reflection of your personal power, the power of your stature amongst your own allies. That's what I wanted. That's why the cards are in it. That, wow. I, 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 if I get nothing else out of this, I am, I'm thoroughly, I'm, I'm giddy over here at your enthusiasm with this game. So let me ask you, have you always been this enthusiastic about the game or is it the fact that it got reprinted? Does, did that kind of re-trigger that or has it always just been, wow, I really, you know, I, I, I wanted to research this and from there it's just been, you know, a hundred, pegged it a hundred the whole time. You know, I'm, I'm just as enthusiastic as I've ever been. I, I love the design and I love the period in history and I only do games about things that I love. So I, I've always been extremely enthusiastic about this. All right, so let's transition to your the other main game that, the other game. that you're yeah. you're yeah. known of, yeah, right. uh, known for, which is Ting Goose that that's came right. out last year, yes. uh, 2016 from Rio Grande. Yes, right? it did. So how? Okay, so I understand now how you were so excited about Seki Gahara. Right. I get that. Right. But now, how did you know air travel in the 30s? How, how did that come to be? Okay. Well. I was fascinated by air travel and by business generally. I, I, I run a business and I'm interested in that and I love business games. I play Power Grid and Acquire and other business games. Those are some of my favorites. So I've always wanted to write a business game. And so I knew I was going to do that and I had to find a theme that, that I felt would be most interesting. I, I like the idea of air travel because it's not just about connecting things. Not a railroad game is about connecting, but air sure. travel is truly about technology. It's about the the, the risks, right? Uh, air travel is is a new frontier, and it is was more new and more more pioneering than than any other form of form of, of tying cities together. So I love that. I love the the technology and the development and the dare angle to it. But also, I thought air air airplane games haven't been done as much as railroad games. So right. I wanna, railroad, I, wanna, I mean extensive. That's right. right. So sure. that, that that was good. And then finally, I wanted to do a business game that felt like business. Here's my critique of business games generally. They feel like machines. They feel like you're accumulating a machine and every turn it gets bigger and better and stronger and more powerful and it just, it, there's this ineluctable progress to, to being fantastic. And so no that, ebb and flow, you're saying? That doesn't feel like a business to me. I mean, okay. I've run a business and to me, business is about white knuckling it until you can make payroll, right? And <laughs> hoping you don't run out of money and just, you know, hoping there's not a recession this year. And, and if you're running a business, an airline business in the 30s, you gotta be hoping there's not a strike and there's not a crash and that oil prices don't change. And I put all that in the game. I wanted the game to be about greed and fear. At the same time, <laughs> at the same time as it's about connecting cities and buying better airplanes, you've got that. You got the tech tree, you've got the, you know, there's, not exactly a tree, but you got the tech advancement. Sure, sure. There's definitely a feeling of technology expanding and business is getting bigger, but there's also a feeling of you're putting it all on a line, right? I mean, I, you don't want to have to take bonds this turn and you don't have much money left, so let's hope there's not another strike or let's, let's hope there isn't a crash. I, I wanted that. I wanted that feeling of risk that should exist in more business games. And as much as I like Power Grid, it doesn't give me a feeling of risk. So that's what I was aiming for, both a historical period that I find fascinating, uh, a technology in development. I love early stages of any technology, but also this, the greed and fear balance that should exist in more business games. So a little bit different though, uh, when you're comparing Seki Gohara and Tengus, and I'm not talking gameplay, I'm, right. I'm talking about the way you went about discovering I guess, the game, whereas you had, okay, I want to do a yeah. business game for yeah. this, whereas Seki Gohara, you just wanted to model that time period, right? Yeah. In both cases, I took something very complicated that I was interested in, whether it was a battle in Japan in 1600 or uh, the, you know, the beginning of an industry, and I just started researching it. And I tried to figure out what were the most important causal relationships? What, what created victory and defeat? And you take something that's too complicated to ever be a game and you just keep reducing it to something more and more simple and elegant until it's playable. And that's my favorite way to design a game. Start with something 
inexplicably complicated and just study it until you understand what were the primary causal relationships and then you have your game. So all about boiling it down to its bare essence to where the game feels right. So on yeah. that note yeah. then, my favorite question to ask of all the designers that I've interviewed, my right. number one favorite question yeah. is how do you decide a game is done? Yes. Because you could tinker forever, right? You can. That's right. I take a very long time to, to finish my games. And even then, I, I don't know that I, maybe I could make them better. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I think every designer tempting. could always go back and as they, as they grow as designers, be mm -hmm. like, well, I could have done this different or yeah. whatever. At some point, you have to stop. But it's so funny, as a designer, I find you very quickly get to a point where you think the game is 80% finished. And then you realize, no, it's only 25% finished. <laughs> and then you think, no, surely it's 90%. And it, no, it's not. It's 27. And there's, there's, you constantly have to disillusion yourself as to the progress of the game. And so designing well is about exposing your own illusions and walking them back and saying, no, actually, this is not yet wonderful. I need to think it again. The other problem that I constantly find in game design is that you'll, your design will reach a, a local maximum such that you, by making small changes, you would not make the game any better, it would be worse. And so it feels done, it feels like this must be it, right? There's no way to, sure, to right. incrementally I'll, make it better. Yeah, this, and all right. It's not done. What you instead need to do is step back from all the assumptions that got you there and realize that a small change is not what you need. You need a big change, you need to rethink broadly and your local maximum is not the general maximum, it's only the local maximum. So you, you need to distance yourself from your own design, and that's why I think it takes me so long to finish a design. I, I have to engage and then distance, and then engage and then distance a series of uh, probes to find better and better maxima. That's fascinating. So ultimately though, well, okay, let, let's take these two examples, the two games that we're talking about in particular. Yes. So Seki Gahara, what was the, or what got you to the point to where you're like, okay, you know what? Yep, nope, I've stepped away and I don't think I need to change this anymore. It was the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was waiting about five years okay. for GMT to publish this game. Now okay. they warned me it was going to be a long time, but okay. it was five years. Right? <laughs> that's a long, and it may have been six that's a years long even. Book. Yeah. And, well, okay, the, the game couldn't be more obscure. I was the first time designer. I'd never written a war game before. You can't pronounce the name of the game. <laughs> it's about a conflict that most people who bought the game didn't know existed. I remember shopping this around, and one publishing house said. I will never publish the game unless you at least change the name <laughs> because no one knows what this is and they can't even pronounce it. So it was, it was certainly a dark horse and I, I'm proud to see it ranked number seven on war, among war games on BGG. Which that's uh, staggeringly uh, high. Compared to like all the other top games are, are conflicts with which Westerners are deeply familiar, even if they're sci-fi conflicts, sure. right? Yeah. They're conflicts that we know very well. And then there's this one that nobody can pronounce. And I, I'm proud of it. It's the one that doesn't match. And I, I'd like to think it's because of the mechanisms. OK. All right. So that's Seki Gohara. What about with Tingu's? How did, how did that come how to How did I be? know that was finished? Or how did I start? Or how, how, sure, go with I, both it, of them. It, it may again have been the deadline. That, that just forced it just forces me to finish. Okay. I mean, I was. Do you do you need? I that wanted push? to do a game with Rio Grande. Okay. All, All right. right. And I, I signed up with uh, with with Jay, uh -huh. knowing that it would be a long wait. He okay. was he was busy with Dominion, and as you know, Dominion wasn't one issue; it was ten issues well, or yeah, whatever it I is mean, he's it, done with that. It's, it's a gold mine for and, them, absolutely. And who sure. Who wouldn't be more interested in selling a deck of cards for thirty bucks? <laughs> right. right? So, <laughs> so for obvious reasons, he was sure. very interested in Dominion, which is a great game. Right. And no, I, no, we I like enjoy it too. It. Yeah. I like it too. So. All right. So he was very engaged in that exceptionally profitable, uh, predictable endeavor. He and likes it, paying the rent. It, Weird. It, yeah, yeah, who knew? Uh, so it pushed Sekigahara back. I'm uh, not Sekigahara, sorry, Tin Goose. Tin Goose it right. pushed Tin Goose back, and it was probably seven years in the queue, just waiting to get published. And I had stepped so far back from it that I needed to kind of reacquaint myself with okay. the design. And when I did, it led to a series of, it was like, it, it, that almost was my second edition. Right, ah. it, was a, it was a reacquaintance and a reimagining of, it's like I rebooted my own game, even though wow. I'd, I'd written it years ago. And so with the reboot, I think it ended up in a good place. Okay. I think, it, it, I think the reboot improved it. Okay. Um, so what's next from Matt Calkins? Well, 
Wait, I'm pretty busy. I got, <laughs> I, <laughs> I got a software company, I just sure. did an IPO. That, that keeps right. me very busy. But with regards to games, I have a bunch of designs and I just don't love any of them enough yet okay. to publish them. They're all at that local maximum stage and I need to back off and then rediscover them. And so at some point, I just moved into a new place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean up the office and I'm gonna start looking at these old designs and seeing if there's any gold in there. Okay. And so, if I can adapt them. So on that note, do you think it's, and take this with a grain of salt. I mean, yeah. obviously everybody would like to do their dream job 24 seven and that's that. I get right. that. Yeah. But do you feel like not having the pressure of constant deadlines, I have to keep churning out games and because you have a successful day job, do you feel like that is to some degree an advantage of being able to pick and choose and let it, you know, uh, kind of gestate over time? Do you feel like that's an advantage for you? Well, in terms of making money in games, it's not well, an advantage obviously at all. Not. Sure. In terms of having a high average quality per game, yeah, it probably is. Okay. It allows me to just say no to designs that I don't don't love. Okay. Right? If they're merely good, they're not good enough. I only want to put it out there with my name on it if it's if I think it's great. That's, so, uh, that's so I awesome. hold back all sorts of stuff. I, I noodle with the design for a while and then I put it in the closet. Okay. All right. So so basically what you're telling me is Sekigara and Tingush, your main two, mm -hmm. get used to them, enjoy them for the next few years, because it may be a little bit. <laughs> I, I don't have another right away. Have lots of designs publishable, sure. just none that I'm choosing to bring okay. right now. All right, fair enough. Um, so what are the rest of your plans? Because you, because uh, when you and I met face to face well, for the first time earlier today, you were like, "Yeah, because I, I, I don't got, have I got a lot every going on this second, week." Exactly. Right? <laughs> I got a lot. <laughs> well, I'm going to play some of my favorite games. Okay. Uh, I'm going to play Power Grid. Okay. I hope to play Acquire. All right. right. I, uh, I'm going to try some new ones. Every time I come to this convention, I try to pick up a new game, and this time I'm going to try Concordia. Oh, yeah. And you haven't played that yet. Uh, I haven't played it. Okay. Or I, I've just, just I've, I've practiced. I mean, I've. I've tried to make it work at home, but sure. I, I haven't played it against gamers. Okay, right. awesome. So, uh, I'm looking forward to that. I think I'm going to get at least two rounds of Concordia in. I played Alhambra last night, and that's an old standby. It's very very simple, but, but fun. Uh, what I'm looking for, actually, is a war game to play. I used to come to the WBC to play war games, and, and I, I was... knows there, there, there's plenty to play There here. are many. That's right. <clears throat> I used to play block games, and they're not played much anymore here. And I missed the uh, the card-driven wave mostly, so I, I don't play Paths of Glory or Twilight Struggle or, or that. Washington's War. Or Washington's War. Right. Though I, I did play the precursor to that, so I, I did play a few of those. I used to play Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage, so the very early CDGs, I was in on those. Okay. But I haven't played the later ones, at least not to the level. I have played uh, Paths of Glory and Twilight Struggle, just not to tournament level. So I'm wondering if there's a, a war game that I could get up to tournament level on. And so I'm kind of nosing around to just uh, see what people are playing, and, and I'm going to look over some shoulders and, and see what I like. That's awesome. So, I mean, let's face it, you're a gamer first this week. I mean, yeah, you're running your tournament, which it's, is highly successful. Oh, uh, and I love running this, by the way. This has got to be the best day of the tournament for me. I, I love see, pe seeing people enjoy this creation, keeps it alive, and uh, it, it's great to see that it holds up to some really smart play. The, the people in this room are great at this game <laughs> and and if it were a, a bad design they'd have figured it out so I, i'm proud that they're still playing it and they they don't feel it to be broken well speaking of which now i i came up here and actually my buddy carmen who you right. uh, gutted uh, earlier today <laughs> i had a great game with carmen <laughs> no, I, and I, he, I enjoyed he said he was he you would and you had uh, used the strategy against him that is not anything that he is used to, in that uh, you went directly on the offensive, and that You're kind right. of flew in the face of what he had expected you to do. It's not what I usually do either. He he gave me Tokugawa. Right. Uh, I didn't make a bid. He just he just gave it to me, and, and and usually with Tokugawa I'll clean up the backfield and then I'll approach on multiple vectors and then I'll use my ability to move twice in a row using the. Uh, the, the high bid for initiative right. to uh, to launch a pincher strike and win a critical battle that, that breaks open the end game. That's my typical way to go with Tokugawa, but this time uh, the <laughs> cards just led me differently and I played a, a war of attrition and I took the battle right to him. And, and he it, said he, he was on his heels the entire time from the very first moment of the game. Well, 
it, you know, if you do this right, uh -huh. if Tokugawa moves fast enough, you can strand much of Ishida's forces minding a backfield that doesn't matter. If you play, if you're going to win in the mid game, it just doesn't matter what happens out at Ueda Castle, right? They, right. They, they can do whatever they want. It's having no impact. So Shokugawa can win in the mid game if he moves quickly and he's successful in that war of attrition. So that's what happened. In yeah, game. no, and he, he told me that if nothing else happens, the rest of WBC, he said that was the highlight of getting his butt kicked by you in the tournament. Well, so. he's, he's, he's a great sport, and I really enjoyed that game. Cool, very cool. And another thing that I think is really awesome that you do with your tournament, because, I mean, it's each of these has its own GM. Every game has its own GM. And you have all these different trophies for different for for participants this is awesome i'm jealous this is my first wbc and now i'm like you know what i'm probably going to get my teeth kicked in next year but when we come back i'm playing this tournament oh i really hope you do and by the way some of those prizes are for people who got their teeth kicked in you, i know <laughs> let, that's let, I mean, awesome let thing. me explain how this works right. right because i bring trophies for everybody there's a that that bronze horseman there with the banner that's for the winner of the tournament right and uh, and i've given away the three uh, statues for high achievers in the first three heats, but in the second, the last two heats, right. right, the fourth and the fifth, that's when all the rest of those things get given away. Those are the honor prizes, we call them. And honor prizes are for anybody who wins a game when it's the fourth or fifth round and they're not gonna win the tournament. Oh, so in right. other words, you stuck around just for the That's love of it. the game. That's right. You stuck it out. You you defended a lost cause, and and that is something that is so honored. I mean, that that it fits with the theme of the game. That's you see. awesome, dude. And so, right in this room, as you noted, there's eleven or maybe twelve, twelve if you counted my game, games going on. Only only four of these people could win the tournament. That's so cool. Everybody else is here because they like the game. And I hope they win a prize, right? Yeah, I mean, that's very I got a lot cool. of prizes for, for the, the people who stuck it out. Good on and, you. you know, I, I think just, that's, uh, that. I mean, it's it's not only good for the players, but it, it, it just, like I said at the very beginning, it's got to feel amazing that these people, like you said, they can't win the tournament. Who cares? They're enjoying the game. They're having a good time, good camaraderie. Everybody that I see seems to be laughing, having a good time. I mean, that's kind of what it's all about here, right? Yeah. So. Awesome, man. Well, all right. I will let you. Uh, I will let you get back to things because I know, like you said, you have a lot going on this week. So, well, Edward, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to your listeners. This has been terrific, and I wish you well with the the podcast. Cool. Thank you very much, Matt. Take care. All right. Good deal. All right. Bye.